Hello everyone, Gregory Bass with my wife Claire Bass and we are here ready to remove the rust. As you can tell, we have a different format because there's a guest here in front of us and we are just, wow, it's just to have him in our house. And I know you see this beautiful item on the table. We'll talk about that in a second, but really we're here today to talk about one of my biggest struggles when it comes to um, my, my formation and continual uh, learning in the faith because I've always just been very hard on myself. And so every time I get into prayer, I tend to be very hard on myself and and question, did that do anything? So I'm really excited to talk about prayer tonight. And I know Claire is too. Is there anything specific that? I just like it all. I love it all. Yeah? I'm ready to learn. Yeah. Well, good. Some of you may be watching and you might know the gentleman on the other side of the table. I want to take an opportunity to once again, thank you for joining. And if you're watching this after it's live, Again, thank you for participating in this show. It streams both on Facebook and YouTube. So if any of your friends don't have Facebook, make sure to tell them about the YouTube channel that we have out there. And do me a favor. If you want to make sure that this message gets out, go ahead and start a watch party on Facebook so everybody can see the great content that we have for the show tonight. Now, the good part. Let's talk about our expert. We have the Reverend Father D.B. Brian Thompson. He was born and raised in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. In 1999, he was received in the church and on May 26, 2012, ordained a priest of Jesus Christ forever at the hands of the most reverend Glenn John Provost, third bishop of Lake Charles. Father Thompson was assigned a parochial, as parochial vicar of St. Henry Parish in Lake Charles. And after two very formative years under the guidance of Monsignor Daniel Torres, Bishop Provost reassigned Father Thompson to Our Lady of Promsecur Parish in Sulphur, where he spent three beautiful and also very informative years under the guidance of Father Edward Richard M.S. Or Richard. Richard. Yeah. I can't believe it's oh, that's Cajun. my mother's maiden name. Hey, I work at a casino. We have a whole bunch of different... Yes, that Texas we have have <laughs> that's right. <laughs> the good Lord and the Bishop <laughs> Provost. Then had a surprise waiting for Father Thompson. He was sent to study at the Catholic University of America to become a canon lawyer. After completing the rigorous program and becoming a bona fide canon lawyer, he was assigned as parish priest of Sacred Heart of Jesus Parish in Creole and, and Our Lady Star of the Sea Parish and Shrine in Creole, where he is currently laboring amongst the good people of Southern Cameron or South Cameron. Mm -hmm. In addition to his duties as the, in the parishes and at the tribunal with canon law, Father Thompson is very pleased to be the circle priest for the St. John Paul II domestic church circle in Lake Charles. There's that thing again, domestic church. It comes up in like yeah, a lot of episodes. It's, it's our first connection with Father Thompson. Yeah. What, what do you mean by that? You want to share with everybody? Well, we were a part of. We were part of that circle. That's right. Yeah. You might have to circle back. Hey, that's the Holy Spirit right there. I like that. I like it too. Father Thompson invites all Catholics in this area to consider making a holy pilgrimage to the shrine of Our Lady, Star of the Sea, where plenary and partial indulgences may be obtained. More information can be found on their Facebook page, Sacred Heart of Jesus Creole and Our Lady, Star of the Sea, Parish and Shrine. Follow and like them there, please, guys. And everybody, help us welcome Father Thompson. Thank you, Greg. Thank you, Claire, very much. Pleasure to be with you. We're, Thank you for being here. Yeah, we're really excited. Can you tell me a little bit more about um, the shrine? Absolutely. The shrine uh, was um, established uh, in 1958 by uh, uh, Bishop Sheck Snyder, Maurice Sheck Snyder, the second Bishop of Lafayette, after the devastating uh, the devastation wrought by the Hurricane Audrey uh, in 1957. Uh, Almost 500 people lost their lives in South Carolina there, um, mostly because of the flooding, uh, the, um, what do they call that when the water comes in, the, the surge. sea surge. surge, thank you, and the, the, uh, which killed so many. And because the weather reports weren't urgent, really weren't as urgent as one might, as certainly as they would be today, yeah. and many people didn't leave, and so they lost their lives. Uh, the men who set up the shrine, who, who kind of paid for it and had a design lost his wife and two children. Oh. Uh, he lives up here in Lake Charles now, but uh, Mr. McCall, he lost his wife and two children. So he, this was a way to remember uh, his own family, uh, but also a way to give 
Catholics and give all really those who live in this area who are affected by hurricanes as we pray in our hurricane prayer every day. You know, we live in the danger uh, and the shadow of a danger over which we have no control. And so we go to Our Lady, it's a place of devotion to Our Lady Star of the Sea under that title by which she calms the, the waves, certainly in our souls, but uh, we also pray through her intercession uh, out in the Gulf as well to spare us from those tragedies. Yeah, I'm kind of embarrassed. Claire has now asked me about five or six times to go there. So I'm like, now we're going to have Father on the show. I kind of have to, like, let's make a trip next weekend. Good, <laughs> so wonderful. We are, planning, to we are planning to go there this weekend. <laughs> You're welcome. And let me tell you that um, uh, in 2010, our bishop, Bishop Provo, um, was able to obtain from the Holy Father at that time, Pope Benedict, a spiritual connection between uh, the, the our little shrine down there in Cameron and the uh, Papal Basilica of, our, of uh, Saint Mary Major in Rome, so that, spiritually speaking, making a pilgrimage to Cameron, far as it may be, nonetheless, uh, it's, a, it's equivalent to making a, a spiritual pilgrimage to, uh, to Rome, to uh, Saint Mary Major in Rome. And what's the value of a pilgrimage? Well, uh, a pilgrimage has several um, meanings, certainly in the Christian life. In a way, it's meant to be a reflection of the whole Christian life, which is a pilgrimage. We are, as St. Paul says, we are sojourners. We are visitors to this life because our real homeland, we hope, is heaven. And so uh, St. Paul encourages many times to live as sojourners, to live as travelers, as passers through in this world. So making that pilgrimage is a great reminder to us that our real goal is not to be comfortable here, but it's to live, it's to go to heaven. You know, uh, we'll talk about maybe St. Teresa of Ava a little bit later, but she described this life as a long night in an uncomfortable inn, right? So you can't wait for it to be over mm -hmm. uh, because where you're going is gonna be a lot better than, than the long night you have to spend in that uncomfortable inn. So uh, the pilgrimage reminds us of that, that we're not meant for this world and so we shouldn't be living for this world. The church in order to encourage us to, to learn those lessons um, uh, offers uh, graces, offers treasures for making those spiritual treasures, of course, for making a pilgrimage. And what's the idea of the pilgrimage? It's the, it's the idea of a travel, a journey to a holy place. And so along the way, especially back in the, in the medieval times, uh, really any time before a car to make a pilgrimage uh, costs a lot of money and it uh, costs you a lot of time and it was very difficult. Yeah, I was about to say it, it's more cost effective for us to go to the Star, Lady Star of the Sea shrine than. <laughs> but, but, but we have a donation box, so you can definitely help yourself. We will certainly do that. Help yourself to, you know, it's to still spend. more cost effective. That's right. Well, good. Uh, no, so it, it, it was, a, in other words, you had to really sacrifice a lot in order to, but, but again, that was meant to be a reflection of the Christian life, that the Christian wants to live this life well, to really prepare themselves to go to heaven to not be uh, distracted uh, by the things of this world, will need to sacrifice a lot. We'll need to despoil himself of many things in order to arrive at the destination. And so that's what a pilgrimage is all about. So uh, added to that, then I was talking about the spiritual treasures. The church offers partial uh, plenary indulgences, also partial indulgences under the usual conditions of uh, confession, uh, worthy Holy Communion and prayers and intentions of the Holy Father. After completing? Completing the pilgrimage, right? So uh, the pilgrimage is to is to go there uh, into the pilgrimage church uh, to visit the Blessed Sacrament, to pray a creed in the Our Father, and then to, uh, we have uh, laminated uh, litanies of the Blessed Virgin Mary, so to pray that litany, we want them back, but they're, they're covered, so you can- uh, you Give can them back. Disinfect, you can <laughs> disinfect them, right? Yeah. Uh, but uh, to go out then to the shrine, which is in front of the shrine church there, and to pray the litany, and uh, and then you know uh, before our blessed lady to ask you know for your own petitions, your own prayers. Uh, that's another thing about pilgrimage. For example, Therese of Dessieu, um her family made a pilgrimage for her healing uh, from a sickness at one point. So making a pilgrimage is also a way of intensifying uh, the 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 power of your prayer of the for your petitions yeah. before God. That's why so many people. I see why you want to go now. Yeah, that makes wow. <laughs> you should just say what he says. I. Well, it's more we're... like for me. It's just more of like a like. She I knows just, it. I, it's a conviction. I I don't. I can't give you all that. But I just know. Like I just gotta go. That's no. Well, we uh, there's a word for that in theology, and and the and that is the sense of the faithful. So even if they can't articulate it. 
the, the, the Holy Spirit at work. This is evidence. I just need to trust it. Yeah. I need to trust the <laughs> desire, right? Yes. And absolutely. just do it. Good for you. Always leading. And I just got to step I'm in front of you so it looks like I'm, I'm kind of doing no, something. We're here on prayer, right? <laughs> yes. Yes. So I, I appreciate you answering that question. But yes, we are here about prayer. And some of these questions might seem elementary, but truly, I mean, I think these are questions that I've had in my mind. I didn't want to ask because I didn't want to look stupid. But really, I mean, I've never cared what people thought. So we're just going to dig in. any stupid questions. And we're going to get that. I agree. I agree. So we'll go on to the first question with that said. It's really for those like me who question how they pray in general, right? Mm -hmm. So their general use of prayer and how they pray, um, the right and wrong of it. So is there a wrong way to pray? Right. That's a great question. And to answer that, I'd like to take a step back and just uh, say three things first. Oh, first, we didn't pray oh, to start pray. off. We should pray to start <laughs> our, our time of prayer, right? <laughs> yes. So in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord God, Holy Spirit, you once descended upon the church and filled her with uh, the power of divine love and the zeal to spread the faith. We ask you to send forth a ray of light that we might now uh, know our holy faith, that we might grow in our understanding and grow in our knowledge, so that growing in our understanding and knowledge, we may also grow in love for our divine Savior, Jesus Christ, and loving him, therefore, put into practice all that we learned, all that he has taught us for our salvation. Give us grace now to understand uh, the beauty of prayer, the draw of prayer, the life of prayer, as essential as foundational uh, to the Christian life and find in prayer a growth of blossoming of our love for our divine Savior. We ask this through the intercession of the Mac of the Virgin Mary and in his holy name, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. 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 That okay. feels better. Yeah, that feels better. I agree. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll sh we certainly will need to talk about feelings in prayer. Uh, yes, for sure, because feelings have little to nothing to do with authentic prayer but we'll get there wow yeah sometimes absolutely. you get a feeling but yeah, yeah. maybe so but he, but let me start let's let's say yeah. uh, i'd like to say three things then one is um i'm not an expert in prayer <laughs> i'm a, i'm a student of prayer a disciple of prayer and i continue to be a disciple of prayer all my life i hope um uh, experts in prayer, the, the, the Immaculate Virgin Mary, she is an expert in prayer. You know, my I brought a friend along with me. Oh, yeah. Yeah. This is my friend, St. Philip Neri. He came along with me. He, he was a master of prayer. Um, so I, I put myself in the school of these great masters, and thanks be to God, we're Catholics. We have beautiful masters of prayer in our Catholic tradition. So that's, that's one thing I would say. The second is, what is prayer? And I think the way that you have entitled this uh, show was, was very well done. I, I think the title is Conversation, right? Conversing, conversing with, with God. God. Conversing with God. Prayer is fundamentally a conversation, right? So, and and I'll come back to that because I want to just put in my third point here. But, but let me ask you this, and we'll come back to your question. Is there a wrong way to have a conversation? Then the third point then <laughs> is conversing with God. <laughs> That's right. That's this right. is the first time I got answered with a question. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a rabbinic technique, it's you know. Clear. It's, it's completely clear. It's, it's a rabbinic clear. technique. So um, then, God, what do we mean? Oh, I, I want to make it clear that when we pray, when we pray to God, we're not praying to some, you know, impersonal force that's out there. God is person. He's personal. I should say he's three persons. One God, three persons. But the point is, you have a relationship with persons, not with things. You have a, a relationship not uh, with um, the face of God in our Lord Jesus Christ, not in some nebulous uh, um, uh, sort of uh, indistinct thing that's out there, life force or whatever you want to call it. That's garbage. That's garbage. It's truly, it's garbage. That's not, God has revealed himself precisely to cast down these false understandings of it. And so we need to know that when we're praying, we're in relationship with one who has, as uh, Pope Benedict said, has taken on a face. Mm -hmm. And he's taken on a face precisely so that we can know him. You know, the Psalms talk about, there's a beautiful Psalm that says, your face, O Lord, I seek. Hide not your face from me. 
So the point is we are coming in prayer before the face of a God who knows us and who wants to be known. That's got to be the foundation of our understanding of what we're doing when we're praying. Otherwise, we're, we're missing it. We're missing out. Which is exactly why it's like, is there a wrong way to pray? Because what you just said. Okay. Is there a wrong way to have a conversation? <laughs> I don't know. Well, what kind of conversation is there if we're in dialogue and I'm doing all the talking? Exactly. That's what I was thinking. You must listen. So I have a follow-up question. And it's essentially, it was, is prayer okay to be silent? Absolutely. In fact, it's necessary to prayer. Here's one beautiful thing about that Catholic music teaches us, authentically Catholic music. So, for example, Gregorian chant, the church's ancient music. Unlike modern music, I mean, there are rests in modern music, and I'm no musician, but I know this. Most modern music, you need to pretty much be playing the whole time. Mm -hmm. Gregorian chant, integral to chant, necessary to chant, are moments of silence. That's a part of the silence is part of the music. Just like silence is part of the conversation with God. Chant is a prayer and it teaches us to pray. There are moments when we need to be vocalizing, when we need to be singing, when, but there are moments when necessary to that prayer, to the chant and to the chant, prayer of chant is silence. Is silence. I, we, we have a little sidekick that joined us. You got to go in your room, buddy. All right. <laughs> they they love when the kids come around, but hey, you're not supposed to be doing it. So I'm kind of off guard because I listened to that answer and then we had him coming. At the same time, I love Gregorian chant. I think it's incredible. I use Amazon for that. I'm like, <laughs> I to it. hey, Alexa, play Gregorian chant. And she's, <laughs> she reads out the whole title. It's super long, but it's incredible. And to, to hear what you said about the breaks, because all too often in my prayer, I tend to feel like I'm focused on what I'm trying to say or filling up the time in prayer with speaking mm -hmm. and, and offertory and thankful and, and all this other stuff. So um, that's, that's why. Well, you know, if you focused all of your attention on how you were trying to say it when you were in conversation with your wife or with your with your sons, it'd be very stilted and artificial. So I tend to do that a lot, right? right. And with the job that I have, my it's I kind of place ideas, mm -hmm. right? So you have to be very delicate and and meaningful or strategic in the way that you do that, and it's not something that's easily or just something I can shut off. So it becomes something for me that I have to consciously think about right. that I can just release, let loose and not be so um, choosy. Mm -hmm. Because why? Because you, um, you have to be aware of the sensitivities of everybody who's around you. Correct. You could certainly, you could not only be uh, wrongly offensive, but you could, um, you could put your job in danger. I mean, there's all sorts of reasons why you want to be aware of the sensitivities of those around you. You're not going to hurt God's feelings, mm -hmm. right? Hey, you're not going to he hurt. He already knows. He knows it all. <laughs> he does. That's right. That's exactly right. He already knows you perfectly. And he's already loved you, not only into existence, but he loved you unto death and death on the cross. I mean, he's already, there's nothing more that he should need to do to prove to you, Gregory Bass, that he is concerned for you and loves you and desire and draws you into greater union with himself. And I think it's kind of the other way. It's me wanting to prove worthiness to be in that conversation. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. How are you going to do that? <laughs> exactly. Here, here's a great thing about here's a great thing about worthiness. This is, I mean, it certainly is related to prayer because it's the foundation of prayer. This, this grace. So in, I don't know if your audience, how, um, how, it's how a, many Catholic, it's from, sure it's very it's diverse. Yeah, it's yeah, it's diverse. So I, I want to, this is a very important Catholic idea, and uh, but, it, so, but, but it's so powerful. So in, in the Catholic understanding, when we are baptized, we are inserted into the life of God. Like our Lord said in John 15, I am the vine and you are the branches, right? So... Uh, we are branches on the vine. We the, A branch only lives its life 
from the vine. It, it doesn't have a life distinct from the vine. Its life is the vine's life, and the vine lives its life through the branches. That's our union with Christ in baptism. And in baptism, that soul, that child, is, is, uh, uh, enters, in, is enters in death of Christ and then the life of Christ, so that that child is in what we call the state of grace, habitual grace, we call that. Theologians have a term for habitual grace that, uh, and, and it's a phrase that means habitual grace, sanctifying grace, is the grace that makes us pleasing to God. What does that mean? It means that when we are in the state of grace, provided we haven't lost that grace from baptism, or if we've lost it, been recovered through the sacrament of penance and confession, that when we are in the state of grace, we are in the state of being pleasing to God. And God is the one who's already made us pleasing to himself. He's given us the gift that makes us pleasing to him. So we never have to wonder if I'm pleasing to God. He has made me pleasing to himself. <laughs> but that's so important. Because it is. It's you incredibly. Can't, you can't impress your father. You can't impress him. You can't. The one that impresses him is his divine son, our Lord and Savior. To enter into him and you will be uh, have him you will be well beloved. It's not only that, because there is a and I again I, I don't want to be all putting to any of your, but we're not um there's a i I'll just I won't name any names, but there's a certain theological view out there that uh, says that we can never do anything that's pleasing to God. And we're just covered with the merits of Christ and that and God sort of overlooks who we are. We don't we're not like that as Catholics. We don't yeah. believe that. Yeah. We believe that grace transforms us. It, it elevates and heals us. And, and it conforms us more and more to be like Christ. So the more um, sanctified, more disposed, the more um, capacity I have for sanctifying grace, for charity, the more I become like Christ. Therefore, the more I, I am pleasing to the Father. That's so cool. But that's the place we need to pray from. That's the place we need to pray from. And, and so the next question, kind of, how do we get there? What You had something to say? Oh, it was just that only maybe a year ago has been, I was just <laughs> told very recently in my life that, and he, he was my spiritual director, Father Orso. He just said it so point blankly. He was just like, you can't earn heaven. <laughs> and that was really the first time I no, that was really the first time I understood it that way. Mm. Um, because huh. yeah. in life, I guess I've just always, I've always focused on really more like what I'm doing wrong and what I'm doing right. And um, it was just, it was very powerful whenever he said that to me. And I, I kind of felt it reiterated whenever you were just mm. saying what mm. you said, but you, you can't, we could never pay back what we've, you know, what we've done. We could never, Make make our retribution, which is why Jesus had to die. Correct. We, we, the, we there was a debt and justice owed to God by Adam and Eve's sin that we could never have paid. Mm. Never have paid. We can't earn heaven, is what he said. Right? right. We can't earn heaven, and and that's very true. Um, I would put it this way: we are adopted into the household of God by baptism. Mm -hmm. We are made more and more conformed to the image of his son by uh, the other sacraments, uh, confirmation, uh, especially uh, the, the worthy reception of the Holy Eucharist, right? We, uh, we, don't, we don't make the Eucharist into ourselves. He makes us into him as we receive him worthily. So we're living in the household of God. What's, what our duty then is to live as loving, trusting, obedient children. If we do that, then then we will have a place forever in the Father's house. If we choose to be disobedient, sin, then we lose our place, right? I just completely related that to my children not being obedient oh, to me, yeah. and then what God must feel like with, <laughs> oh, yes. oh my God. with all of us. Ever since Patrick was like, I remember the first time I heard it. Like the, the Oh my he gosh. Was, so many times when I'm correcting my children, I hear God like tell me, you too. <laughs> but I remember the first time I was in our apartment. We were in, at, and Patrick was like seven months old. And he was crawling towards me. I was unloading the dishwasher and he kept wanting to reach for these knives. And I had to keep telling him no. And he was upset. And he was so mad. And I was just like, 
okay, God, I heard that. Mm. <laughs> you know, I know what's good for you. You can't have a knife, <laughs> even though you want it really bad. <laughs> that's that's exactly right. Yeah, that's exactly right. Of course, this is precisely the 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 thing that's really underneath Adam and Eve, right? The the prohibition of taking the fruit. It wasn't simply that they would know good and evil. It was that they would decide good and evil for themselves. Mm -hmm. And what their father wanted from them is, trust me. Yeah. I'll teach you what's good and I'll teach you what's evil. Just, just trust me. Trust me. And that's really what was rejected when they decided to take for themselves the, yeah. the fruit. And, and you know, certainly uh, we were mentioning earlier, we were talking Adam's trust. Eve's trust died because of her desire to decide for herself. Adam's trust died because he uh, wasn't willing to risk. He was a punk. <laughs> he wasn't, yes. But he was a punk. I, I call him a chump. He wasn't willing to risk death. He didn't trust his father far enough. No as, judgment, obviously. With his own life. No judgment on Adam? No, Adam did wrong. Well, I know he did, he did wrong, wrong, but I'm not saying. <laughs> I would like to think in the situation I'd be correcting, but. Oh, yeah. I have no idea. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm not saying I would do better than Adam. Right. Um, it's not a comparison between me and Adam. Right. That's what I'm. That's all I was making very yeah, yeah. clear. The father, the father of our not, of our race yes. had, and so this is the thing that we need to think of: the, the father and mother of our race. They had, they had, what we not only sanctifying grace. They had preternatural gifts that none of us have. They lost them for us, you know. In addition to sanctifying grace, and still they fell. And you said, "Well, how could that be?" Well. You could say the same, and we're getting a far from prayer, but yeah. you could say the same I'm thing. I'm about to bring us back. Okay. We're good. Good. About, about the angels. Like, how did the angels, the angels who comprehend everything in one act of knowing, how did they fall? We won't go down that. Right. Yeah. Yes. We actually God, kind of started going down that hole one episode before, yeah. right? Because Patrick asked the question, could the devil be forgiven? So we started going down that hole because we see angels all of eternity and they made the decision based off of what they already knew, which is, yeah, it's, but yes, we are here for prayer and we already kind of talked about God leads the decision. That's why I let it go because it was fascinating. Mm. I, mean, I just love all this stuff. Again, I tell everybody every week we, we have basically Wednesday movie night after the show because we watch the show <laughs> so we can truly get all the value from it. Because uh, when you think about the next question and how to segue into it, you don't necessarily get all the information. So that's when we get the notebooks out and get everything going. But since we already kind of covered if there was a wrong way to pray. So the answer is yes, there's a wrong way to pray, right? Right. Um, there a wrong way to, so God, does, like right now, we're in dialogue. If we're going to be authentically in dialogue, you deserve my attention. Right. And I deserve your attention. And if I try to split my attention with my phone, for example, very common. Or driving. Or driving or whatever. I mean, <laughs> there's an old saying. I, I won't say which religious order it comes from. But uh, they, they always they ask the question, well, can you? Uh, they say, well, they, they, I'll just give the response. You know, it. I know. I'm pretty sure. Can't if you don't say it, I won't know it. So I mean, okay. you, <laughs> just, you say it. You're you, gonna say it way better than me. Well, that uh, you I'm can. Sure you can pray while you smoke, but you shouldn't should not smoke while you pray. And I've always heard you can uh, work while you pray, but you shouldn't. Pray That's probably work. better. Pray while you work. Yeah. I'm not promoting smoking. Yeah. Whatever. It's not, I'm not. No judgment. Yeah, it's it was fine. a statement. But yeah, <laughs> that makes perfect sense. But yeah, yeah. The point is that God deserves your attention. Now, with all the other things we do in life, of course, we want to, as it were, have that as a prayer. So the, you know, and what is that? That that you know, pray always. That primarily is your intention. Like so, I when you go to work, when you begin the day, to to dedicate, Lord, I want to dedicate this morning to you. I want to offer to you whatever the pains and trials and joys will be. I want to live them for you to the honor of your sacred heart. Um, you know, and so then you live your day constantly in that, and and you can recall that. For example, if you're 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 working away, and then you're ding, and you're tempted to go and and kind of spend some time on Facebook over here. But you say, but Jesus, I'm doing this. I'm working for you, so I'm not going over Facebook. I'm going to keep working away or whatever. You know, that's the idea that that all that we do in our intention can be is meant to be for the Lord, and we renew that intention throughout the day. But as the Catechism says. We'll never pray at all times if we don't discipline ourselves to pray at certain times. So those are the times where God deserves our, our whole attention. Our Lord Jesus Christ 
deserves our entire attention. Our Heavenly Father deserves our entire attention. God the Holy Spirit deserves our entire attention. And we need to be there. Now we can talk about later, there will be distractions. That's mm. that, that's that's the human condition. None of us are angels. We can't pray like angels. Um, uh, there are states of prayer where distractions are excluded. We probably don't have time to go deeply into that. But in general, from for most of us, almost all of us, and even those who reach those states of prayer, distraction is going to be a part of prayer. Again, we can come back to this, but those who are really, I would say, if you're struggling with, with distractions, it's an opportunity for you to, out of love, turn back, turn back, turn back to the Lord. Um, you, you're being, you've pulled away, pulled, called away, you can say no. And every time you say no and turn back, now you've made this act of love. No, you're more important than whatever this other thing is. You're more important than my shopping list. You're more important than the, my uh, honeydews around the house. You're more important than uh, the 10 projects I have waiting on the desk, you know? So saying that, is there, I know that most prayers begin with the sign of the cross, right? So in preparation of prayer, is there something that we should do to be prepared? Yes. Well, let's talk about, right, of course there is. As I just said, one thing we should do is to strive to be in a state of grace. Right. Um, also, of course, then, uh, what's your environment like? Like when you're, when you're sitting down to pray, are you try, is, is someone sitting down to pray with uh, the music on or with the television on? Or has the music or television just been on? So that you know, what kind of environment are you are you creating for this time where you're going to dedicate exclusively to the Lord? Um, we need to realize that we are body and soul composite, and so my position, the way I, the way I, if I'm kneeling or standing or sitting, or whatever it is, that's either going to help me pray or hinder my prayer. Um, whatever I filled my mind with up to that point, that's why almost all the saints recommend. You know, uh, if, if especially if you're going to have only one time of prayer in the day, to pray first thing in the morning, so that all the other things that you will have done in your day won't come flooding into your time of prayer. Sometimes, sometimes it's not possible. You have to reserve that time in the evening, or you know, whatever. But in the morning, you're fresh, and you can give the best part of your day to the Lord. That's certainly the ideal. So yes, there are things to do. Let me say this too, though. We probably should, and I don't remember whether or not uh, you're planning, but we need to talk about to styles of prayer or Correct. types of prayer right because uh how you prepare will differ depending on those styles or types and then that's what i was going to say so um the types of prayer since you said if you're going to have prayer in the morning or whatever and by types of prayer are you referring to uh individual family couple is that the type of prayer you're referring to no but that oh that's very good too that's also true so those are um um, the catechism refers to three different styles of prayer. Generally speaking, you have uh, vocal prayer, you have, and then you have uh, mental prayer, or um, could be called discursive prayer, or could be called meditation, and then you have contemplation as a as a third style of prayer. And uh, we can again, we can touch on each of those and talk about that. Yeah, I'd love to. I, I'm unaware of. Um, well. Um, in terms. So vocal prayer is just what it sounds like. It's a prayer that's already written, right? And so Our vocal, Father. the Our Father, the Hail Mary, the Glory Be, okay. the Act of Contrition, the, I mean, almost, so if it's written down, then it's, and it's meant to be recited, it's a vocal prayer. You can pray it silently. May I ask this question? Because it goes right in hand with what you're saying. Yes, let me just say you can pray it silently, okay. but it's still a vocal prayer. Okay. Go ahead. Because... Okay, yeah. The, uh, in Catholicism and other religions, there are many prayers that one may recite, right? Meaning it's written or documented. So should all moments of prayer include that type of prayer, like the Our Father or the Hail Mary or the Glory Be? Should all moments of prayer, that I would say is probably too wide a statement. To say Do you that mean like should, should you should begin that way? Right, so should you begin prayer with... Uh, resuscitation of the Our Father? Is it? I, I think depending on how far along or how how consistent and how developed your spiritual life is, um, 
mostly that would be a good way to begin, could be a good way to begin. It depends on, again, what style of prayer you're engaging in, right? Maybe right at this moment, I'm going to pray the rosary. And in a later moment, I'm going to have my, my mental prayer, my, my discursive prayer, whatever you call it, my meditative prayer. They're different names for the same thing. Right. So it depends. It just depends. Sometimes you uh, the rosary obviously is a vocal prayer, but the rosary is very special because it's a vocal prayer that's meant to lead to meditation and contemplation. So it's not just getting through 50 Hail Mary, you know, five of our fathers and 50 Hail Marys and five glory bees. That's not the point of the rosary. Okay. That's that's a very um, shallow way to approach the rosary. But that is an example of vocal prayer that leads into uh, mental prayer or a meditative prayer and then perhaps contemplative prayer. That's so, why we have the mysteries. Yes, Correct. that's what we're meant to be meditating upon. That's why it's important to say it. With the rosary, okay. right. So those three types of prayers, is it a transition or is it you do one or the other? Well, uh, so mental prayer and uh, our, our discursive prayer or meditative prayer is, it's distinct. There are, there are three distinct types of prayer. Okay. And I would even say that contemplative prayer is not something so much that we do, but that God does in us. It's an advanced state of prayer, right? It's what we can dispose ourselves to by meditation, but we cannot, uh, we cannot ourselves uh Force contemplative prayer. It's God's action in the soul. And so the catechism mentions it so that we'll know that it exists and that it's um it's to be desired. You know, Saint Saint Teresa of Avila says it's to be desired for sure. But again, we can't bring it about. It's not it's not up to us to bring that about. Mm -hmm. um, certainly there there are moments I would I would say, perhaps you've experienced this in your marriage. I'm certain that other married couples certainly have, where they experience a type, they're, they're sitting together, they've gotten to know each other very, very well, sitting together and they're not saying anything, but they experience a great union in their hearts. That's a glimpse of contemplative prayer where that union of heart is experienced with the heart of our Savior, with, with God. Oh, wow. Wow. But you can see how it's nothing you can engineer. You can't bring right. that about. You can't bring that about. Well, that's kind of like the statement somebody made. I don't know if it was you, but said you, it's. Oh, it was at mass. It's not something that you learn. It's something that's revealed to you, right? The um, mystery of the Holy Trinity. Correct. Yeah. Um, whenever they were talking about it in the homily, so kind of. That's. <laughs> you know the um, your your your. Audience probably knows it well, but there's this. Uh, uh, Saint Augustine talks about this, uh, his own struggle to try to figure out the Trinity. Mm. And um, one night he had a dream, uh, as I understand. One night he had a dream, and in his dream he was walking along the shore of the sea. You know, uh, uh, he's from northern Africa, so they have the, the Mediterranean is right there. And as he walks along, he sees this kid, this boy who's uh, on the shore, and the, he's he has this bucket. And he runs out into the into the water, and he collects the water in the bucket, and he brings it back and on the shore. And he says, there's something on the shore. And as he gets close, he sees there's a, there's a little hole. And the kid pours it in, and then he runs back in, and he puts another another bucket of water in there. And then he goes back to that hole, and he uh, pours it in again. And and he gets he says he says kid, what, what are you what are you doing? He says, oh oh, I'm I'm going to take the the water of the Mediterranean and put it in that hole. And he said, you, you, you'd never be able to do that. That's impossible. Though. You can't fit the whole Mediterranean in, in that little hole. And the kid in Augustine's dream looks up and, say, and says, why are you trying to fit the great mystery of the divine God in your little head? <laughs> I love that you said that because I tried to tell you that. Yeah, like, I yeah. Yes. And You're a great storyteller. Wow. He's definitely a better storyteller than me. But I was I heard that story not so long ago with the boys, and I was just wow. like blown away. And I tried to relate it to him. I didn't do a good job, apparently. But I'm so glad you said that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, it's, it, it, it's important to teach us that you were asking about ways to, to prepare for prayer. Humility is an essential way to prepare for prayer. St. Teresa of Avila says that humility is the door for entering prayer. And unless we go through that door, we'll never enter into prayer, mm -hmm. real prayer. 
Uh, one of our viewers has a question for you. They want to know if it's wrong that she teaches her first grade students the three ways to pray are praying the words they learn, one, two, talking one-on-one -on -one like a friend, and three, singing and praising God. No, I don't think that's wrong. Um, I'm not sure if I understand. So if I understand the I'm not sure I understand the question correctly. Okay. Uh, in as much as are those three, I wouldn't say that those are three other ways of describing what the catechism calls uh, vocal of prayer. prayer, mental, uh, you know, mental prayer, meditation, and contemplation. But those are three beautiful ways to teach children. Uh, three ways of prayer. Certainly, singing is a way of praying. You know, singing is as Saint Augustine says it. Singing is proper to the heart that loves. Um, and so singing is, uh, not too long ago, we celebrated the Feast of St. Ephraim, and uh, he was a Syrian deacon. And uh, at, at, during his time in the fourth century, uh, uh, some heretics, some Aryan heretics, they would, they would use song to try to teach their false beliefs and try to inculcate in their false beliefs. So St. Saint, uh, Ephraim, the deacon, he was, uh, his nickname is the Harp of the Holy Spirit. But he would he would come up with other songs that would teach the true unorthodox faith, and that sort of chased away the the, um, the false beliefs that were out there about Christ our Lord, the Aryan beliefs. So definitely, singing is is a beautiful way of prayer. Uh, yes, uh, attending to the words and then having that conversation. So that conversation one on one with God that brings us really into meditation. Um, and I think a great way to begin to pray exactly is something called Lexio Divina, Lexio Divina, right? What is Lexio Divina? It's a Latin word that means divine reading. What does it really mean? I would say that Lexio is a monastic way of praying um, in which the, so certainly it could be used with other books, but really it's meant to be a way of praying with sacred scripture. And um, it begins, it's got four stages in Lexio Divina. First is Lexio, meaning reading. Uh, then it's um, uh, medita medita meditatio, meditation, and I'll come back to this and explain that. And then it's um, uh, contemplatio, and then it's oratio. So Lexio is reading, meditation. In meditation is a discursive or a reasoning exercise. What am I doing? I'm, I'm, so I'm taking the passage from Scripture, and I would definitely recommend that if you're just beginning this, just learning this, use the Gospels. Use the Gospels. The point of our Christian walk is to get to know the heart of Jesus. So begin with the Gospels, especially. Um, and with the daily reading. You, you could do the daily reading. Um, or just read from the Gospel and well, use footnote, meditate on it. I'm asking because that's the way that I've done it in the past. It, it, there's nothing wrong with that. That's a, you know, um, sometimes, though, you may feel, if you do the daily reading, you may sometimes feel like you have to keep going to the next one. Whereas you um, might really want to just the next day stay with what you were on because there was so much fruit there. There was so much drawing of the Holy Spirit there. Oh, I love that. Yeah. I have experienced that. Where yeah. like one day the, the gospel was like amazing to meditate on. <laughs> and then, then the next day, I mean, it was it was obviously a still prayer. It was still good and I still, you know, gave an effort, but it wasn't as. Or you read five days until you finally get yeah. One that does I've give you the fruit that you right. Don't I, I would just say though again when I especially when I mentioned that prayer is not about feelings, it would be important not to confuse feelings with the fruit. So right. um, the real fruit of prayer is your readiness to be to love Christ and to serve Him uh, in in your faithful walk with Him in, in life. That's the real fruit of prayer. The your transformation into Christ. Um, and part of that transformation is a deeper understanding. So that's also a, a fruit as well. So meditation. So you may want to stay with that. So the next day, don't feel like you need to go to the, tomorrow, the next day's gospel. Go back to that one that you were with. And maybe after your, your time of prayer that day, it won't prove fruitful that day for many reasons. God was working in that day for that reason. You know, with this, maybe you'll find it continues. So stay with it as long as it continues. Hmm. But meditation, meditatio, is a consideration of the truths of the phases that are here. And so we, we use our reason. It's discursive. Well, you know, I see, uh, let's take the, the woman with the hemorrhage, and she comes and wants to touch the cloak of our Lord, right? So there are many, many things you could, you could um, consider. 
you could you could reason about you could consider her her fear versus her courage, right? And you could uh, uh, consider that that fear and courage uh, that she may have experienced, or the gospel tells us she did experience. And what would have happened if she didn't have the courage? You know, if she had remained with her fear, if she allowed her fear to to cage her, as it were. And then, you know, what about in my life, Lord? Where where have I allowed my fears to cage me? And so I'm talking, right? So um, to consider the chief truths are there. Another, another chief truth that you know she touched his cloak. So Christ, his power, he has chosen for his power to work through. Uh, matter to work through, you know, material things. We are incarnate creatures, right? And so um, there are those who are so spiritual that they reject the idea that God works through uh, the things that He has created. And yet, the, the scriptures are full of that truth, you know. So to begin to to just consider that. Then the next step is the contemplatio, contemplation. I said earlier that contemplation is not something we can do, and that is true. What the monks mean by contemplatio in this is to know, to stop reasoning at some point and then sit with the beauty and the goodness of that truth that you've come to understand through your process of reasoning, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe maybe that, that, that truth about God working through created things just arrests you. Stay arrested there. Stay arrested. That's where the Holy Spirit is bringing you into that deeper prayer. The last is the oratio, which is a, a, the dialogue then with Christ. Uh, the oratio just means prayer. And this is all Latin, right? Those are Latin words, right. right? You don't have to use Latin words. I can't remember. It's been too long since I've read in the catechism if they give you the Latin and the English or if they only give you the English. I think they give you the Latin, but I'm not certain. Okay. But the oratio, the, then, then you bring that into dialogue. Lord, I thank you for... Uh, you know, so redeeming creation that you choose to continue to work through material things. In the church, you communicate uh, divine life to me through the sacraments. You've chosen to elevate matter itself to be a channel of divine grace for me. I I'm grateful for that. I thank you, Lord, for my baptism that happened on this day. And I know when my baptism happened, you know, I thank you, Lord, for my confirmation. I thank you for the priest who baptized me, for the bishop who confirmed me, for it. I thank you for feeding me with your very body and blood, you know, that comes to me. Uh, through these, uh, these, you know, so th this could be your prayer, uh, the eratio at the end of that, of those four steps. That's a good way to begin, I would say, entering into mental prayer, because vocal prayer is good, but it's, the, a person whose spiritual life is developing moves beyond vocal prayer, never leaving it behind. Teresa, Teresa of Alvarez is never leaving it behind, but does move beyond into a deeper prayer. And this kind of Lexio Divina is a, is, is a way, an example of that deeper prayer. It's a game changer. Yeah, I mean, yeah. wow. Would you say that that um, approach can be applied not only with scripture? I'm just seeing a, a relation in my life, and I could be completely off, and please tell me if I am. But just when I'm out in creation, often I'll see something in nature I'll relate it back to the truths that I've learned about God. And then I'll thank him like that for it. And so I kind of feel like what I'm doing when I notice these things in my daily life mirrors this lecture you know, that you just explained. And so I'm just wondering, I mean, cause that's not, obviously that's not, I didn't prepare for that prayer. I didn't go into it, but is that prayer or is that just experience or I don't know. Are you, are you know. in, I, are I just, you in dialogue with God? I feel like I am. Well, but, then, but but that's a then you're in prayer. Okay. What do you mean you feel like you are? I mean, I feel like I. No, it's an objective fact that you've okay. raised up your mind and heart to the Lord, right? Okay. You said you said you thank Him. You 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 see a connection between the truths of our faith and 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 His beauty, beautiful work in creation. You're not saying, oh, um, I wonder how that got here. No, you know that yeah, He did yeah. that. He yeah. did that, and you're yeah. seeing the connection. And so yes, okay. and then you turn him and thank Him that this is prayer. This is prayer. The Lord, the Holy Spirit Himself, is leading you into a deeper understanding of the of the connection here of the of the fingerprints of God. You might say, right? I mean, because in that moment, I definitely feel relationship and like you're like you're here with mm -hmm. me, like right now. Yes, 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 so, yes. And I and I want to say, since you're talking about feelings, it's not that uh, we never receive uh, good feelings in prayer. We certainly can and do. It's just that that's not the thing to seek. Mm -hmm. It would be like your children loving you only for the things you give them, 
rather than for you yourself. Right. It's pretty shallow to love someone only for what you get. Mm -hmm. And there's no real relationship there. Uh, that's treating someone I love as a Coke machine. As long as I can get what I want, then... That's like, yeah, that's like always... That's like... And I, I can do this too, but like whenever something bad happens, you know, then you just rush to prayer. <laughs> and so, you know, you're petitioning and petitioning, but to try not to, to be that fervent only when you're asking when every you time to bad, right? Right, right. Yeah, of course, because it, it, there should be a relationship there mm -hmm. between you and the Lord. I mean, right, so that when something bad, it's just like, hey, by the way. <laughs> well, it would be like a child going to their own parents, you know I mean? Yeah. Uh, they're convinced that their parents are concerned about all of their lives. Mm -hmm. And certainly they should be sharing all of their lives with their parents. And so that when something bad happens, yes, uh, obviously mom and dad are concerned about that and want to do what they can to uh, make it better if that's the best thing. Of course, sometimes it's not the best thing. Depends on what it is. That's right. Sometimes you just have to cry because you can't get the knife. <laughs> but it's just not good for you. <laughs> it's exactly. not right. Just because it feels good doesn't mean you should do it. No, so it's better that you or cry. Or just because it's shiny. There you are. Attractive. Right? It looks good. Doesn't mean it won't kill you or cut you. <laughs> exactly. Yes. I say I say when I'm preparing couples for baptism and we're talking about Genesis and we're talking about Adam and Eve, and I say, you know, I point out to them, God didn't say um, to Adam and Eve, if you take uh, the apple, I will kill you. He said, if you take the apple, you will die. Just like parents don't say, if you touch the hot stove, I'm going to burn you. Burning the is the nature, the consequence yeah. of touching the hot stove. The nature of sin is spiritual death. That's how it goes. Now we still choose it. Hmm. Gosh. You know what? Your answers are just so magnificent. Like, I don't even have to ask five of the questions because you really answered them into, into it. But I have one that's really on me mm -hmm. because I've been wanting to kind of having children in prayer, right? And we have family mm -hmm. prayer, and that usually is a lengthy time. Wanting to have some type of connection is are we able to script our own family prayer to maybe, you know, write something? for our family to pray? Is that, is that a creative thing that you can do or is it like frowned upon? I don't see why not. I mean, obviously, write right, write a prayer for her. It's, it would be like you spontaneously praying and you just decide that you want to spontaneously pray the same way all the time. <laughs> right. That's what I'm saying. Did it almost isn't spontaneous. No, it's Are not. you talking about the boys? Because the boys have specific things and it's almost like we can predict. No, no, exactly I'm talking about like, what if we wrote okay. one that said blah, 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 okay. and what we want to, because yeah, they do tend to say the same thing. So what if we just wrote a small prayer that allows them to be thankful for the many things that they always say that for, but then allow them to move deeper into prayer, right? And I'm thinking that's the way to do it because they can get through that particular piece with something they can recite together with us. Yeah. Oh, right. So they, they know that, that those bases that they always say are covered. It's and then, covered. Yeah. And then they can expand. Like it's certainly okay, though, for children. They need routine, mm -hmm. especially when they're young. They need that routine. If they even need routine in prayer. And for us, routine becomes shallow, but not necessarily for them. It, 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 oh, um, no. I, yeah, I sense that they are equally <laughs> thankful every time they say exactly. it. Exactly. <laughs> they're truly genuine yeah. in their gratitude. Yeah. Nicole and, Lanthier says, spontaneously pray the same way all the time. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's true. But at the same time, it's being creative in prayer. True. Yeah. Now, can you elaborate on prayer is not a feeling? Yes. Um, so... Um, I understand what you're saying, what it, what it's for, what it should be doing, where, what it's preparing us for. Mm -hmm. yeah. Prayer is a relationship. Right. And so sometimes in relationships you get good feelings and sometimes you don't. But the relationship is still real and it's still there and it still needs to be maintained and it still needs effort and it still needs time um, and it's still valuable when you're getting good feelings from a relationship and when you're not. So a good example of this is Mother Teresa, uh, St. Teresa. Didn't she like have a struggle on Calcutta? Yes, sir. Well, I, the truth is though, all three Teresas, Teresa of Avila, of Jesus, Teresa of the Sierra, the little, uh, the little, little flower, flower, 
and Ter Teresa of Calcutta, St. Teresa of Calcutta, Mother Teresa, they all had actually times of uh, intense dryness in their prayers. Okay. And that, you know, uh, St. John of the Cross very famously uh, discussed those things in uh, he, he, in his spiritual teaching, he talked about the two nights, the night of the senses, the night of the uh, soul. Um, I, I feel like I... I wouldn't want to say too much about that in this context, just because we don't have a lot of time to launch yeah. into that. And I don't know that uh, it's something that would be better with a, a good one-on-one -on -one spiritual director talking about those nights. But just to say that God intentionally does, those who are persevering along the way, God intentionally does withdraw not only good feelings, but any sense of his presence at all. And so you feel it's a night, as it were. And all you can see is the very next step. All you can see. And there's, so there's no consolation of saying, okay, I can see the end. I can make it. I can make it. No. You just have to keep going with trust. And so, um, but but even taking a step back from those, uh, the two nights, um, uh, the Lord wants us to be in an authentic relationship with him. As I was saying before about children and parents, uh Loving someone only for what they give you is not an authentic relationship with love. So if I love God only because he makes me feel good, then I don't love God. I love myself. Right. And so he wants to wean me off of that and so that I can begin to love him for himself. And and certainly in the midst of that, he's not going to they're not going to let us. He's going to encourage us and, and strengthen us along the way. But, of course, we have to be willing and ready to engage also to go forward with confidence, with trust, uh, with courage. Uh, prayer and a life of prayer is not for the faint of heart. It's not for, uh, there's no such thing as the armchair mystic. That's that's false, right? That's a, a creation of a post-modernity and, and the comfortable West. Um, it just is. Yeah. It's, it's just is. No, I'm just thinking about our joke. Uh, whenever I said I haven't met someone more knowledgeable, and you're like, I got to introduce you to more people, and like yes. I have, there's people on here that's like, you're putting way too much of the Mediterranean Mediterranean water in my head right now that I can't even process. <laughs> <laughs> so, thank you for agreeing with me, by the way, out there. I mean, I know it's just it's it's overwhelming the information that we're getting, but at the same time, it's so fruitful. It's on the video. You can it, oh, video. Believe me, <laughs> we shall That's right. multiple times. And we've addressed a lot of the questions, but I want to have some time to discuss this. And mainly because it's a huge blessing you have brought. And I know you, you spoke about it briefly, but you brought a relic here. And since, um, not everybody's Catholic on here. I don't know if all religions use relics. I imagine not, since the Catholic Church basically uh, has rights to relics, right? Rights? Well, I suppose so. Uh, they are, they're the bodies of Catholic saints. I don't know why, you, you know. Anybody else would, yeah. Although I'm told that uh, if you search on certain online sites that you can find a number of claimed relics. So I would be very careful because you don't always know that those are authentic relics. Okay. Um, they're, they're, believe me, unscrupulous people would be very happy to sell you uh, a piece of chicken bone and tell you that it's it's a piece of uh, Saint Clair. Mm. Uh, you know, I mean, they, they'd be very happy to take your money and give you a false product. Of course, that's shysters are have always been around and will until the end yeah. of time. You know, and, and wouldn't it be like not okay to even sell a relic? So it's uh, because it's a of its grave. Yeah. Terrible sin to sell to sell a relic. Yeah. There's a debate about whether or not it's a good thing to rescue relics. Right. Because the debate. We actually experienced that. And yeah. well, my sisters and I experienced that when we were in New Orleans. They were selling this relic, and she ended up buying it because she, I don't know. I don't remember the most, but I think she consulted a priest before she did. Anyway, yeah, she felt that she needed to. Right. Well, maybe, and you know, you might have the sense that that, that yeah. you can, if it's an authentic relic, that you're really going to rescue something from being otherwise abused by somebody who doesn't know what it is and doesn't care what it is, you know? Yeah, or knows what it is and wants to... Wants to destroy it. Yeah. So can you tell us about your relic? Yes. I'm very, very pleased to have this relic. Perhaps the one of the greatest gifts I've ever received. It was given to me by a very uh, dear friend, a good priest up in Washington, D.C. Um, 
And this, is, I was ordained on the 26th of May, which is the feast day of St. Philip Neri. St. Philip Neri is called the uh, second apostle of Rome. Uh, he was actually born in Florence, uh, but the first apostle of Rome is a double apostle, Peter and Paul. And they're the first apostles of Rome, the foundation of Rome. But um, in St. Philip Neri's time, uh, he moved from Florence to Rome and um, Rome was at that time um, in the depths of um, immorality and other uh, terrible things. So Philip Neri came about and the style of life that he lived, the, 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 the things that he began, he transformed the people spiritually uh, in Rome. And so he's called the Apostle of Rome because he transformed them uh, to fervor and to love of God and to, you know, um, uh, living authentic Catholic lives and, and change the face of Rome, the complexion of Rome. Uh, so this is Philip Neri. So uh, before he was even a priest, he was living in Rome and he used to love to uh, pray in the catacombs. Uh, the catacombs is the, are those, uh, are graveyards, uh, cemeteries uh, that were underground. Um, at the, at, they are underground today. Back then, they were not underground. Uh, they were they were over right. There. We built over top of them. Right? Very much like in New Orleans, you have uh, you know this uh, oh, okay right with monument. Really? Yes. So you see the graveyard like that, and and you know all the they're all above ground. You know as there still are really many places in 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 Italy and other European countries today. So they were like that back then, but they were they were necropolis. They were a city of the dead. Um, but Christians would go there to because they would kind of be out of the eye of um, uh, of the Roman authorities, and they would pray. Um, they would have mass sometimes over the relics of the saints. Uh, they wouldn't always have mass out there, but it's not like that was the only place they could pray. Uh, but they did have mass out there sometimes. But also, of course, uh, the saints were buried out there. And uh, so, speaking of relics, that's how. Uh, the, from the very beginning, the Christians understood that exactly what St. Paul said, that, you know, uh, our, our very bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit as well. So the person who's sanctified in grace, who's transformed in Christ, his body or her body remains holy as well. And even from the beginning, they would, they would collect the bodies of those who had been torn apart by the lions or had been killed by the gladiators. They would, they would soak up their blood with their napkins and things like that because they understood that this body was an instrument of God for holiness in the world, right? And so Philip Neri loved to pray out in the catacombs, and by his time they were underground. Um, and he was out there praying uh, one day, and he had a, an intense uh, experience of the Holy Spirit. He was very devoted to the Holy Spirit, so intense an experience of the Holy Spirit that the Holy Spirit came down in a globe of fire and entered into his breast, and his heart expanded. So this was the story of all the Philip's life. Like he, he, you could feel something, you know, with his with his ribs and everything. And he he gave off this heat. So several saints have given off this heat, but he would give off this heat. And um, it was all told about his life. When Philip Neri died, they opened him up. They wanted to check out his story actually, and they saw that his two ribs were broken from the inside and had healed back. The, the point of, the, of them noticing that they'd healed back is that. Uh, it couldn't have been congenital. He wasn't born that way. It was broken at some point in his life. And, and then back. So that, that is the heart that expanded with the love of the Holy Spirit. And thanks be to God, this relic is a piece of Philip Neri's heart. We are never, ever, ever getting rid of this table. <laughs> yeah. Isn't that beautiful? Maybe even the house that was over there. Too. Isn't that beautiful? It's insane. It's so, so a huge gift for him to bring that to the house. And obviously um, he... He just did it and graced us with that. And then uh, we were talking about prayer today. And, you know, as I said, Philip Neri has a great devotion to the Holy Spirit, who is the true master of prayer. Uh, and I should say that in the, uh, maybe as I said earlier, uh, in the life of the church, God has raised up certain saints to be guides for us in prayer. You know, uh, certainly um, St. Benedict, uh, uh, in her own way, St. Scholastico, a woman of intense prayer, Benedict's sister. Uh -huh. um, in fact, the the old the Benedictine saying about Scholastica is that she was able to do more than Benedict because she loved more. You know, <laughs> that's a beautiful story. Um, but anyway, uh, then you know Saint Thomas Aquinas and Saint Anselm and uh, uh, just a number of um, we move into more of the modern period. Uh, Saint Ignatius Loyola, 
St. John of the Cross, St. Teresa of Avila. Uh, these are great masters of prayer for us. Uh, uh, even uh, closer to our time, uh, St. Francis de Sales, uh, St. Um, Alphonse de Liguri. So we have just been blessed with uh, St. Teresa of the Sieur, uh, in, a, in our own way, I would say St. Teresa of, of um, Calcutta. But some of, some of these uh, great saints are even doctors of the church and, and specifically for their teaching on prayer. So we have been given under the Holy Spirit uh, we've been given these great guides in, in how to enter into prayer. And so I would say to you that there is, in the life of the church, I gave you Lexio Divina. Right. But in the whole tradition of the church, the authentic tradition of the church, there are uh, there are other kind of modes of prayer related to that, but they go off in slightly different directions. There's a very Ignatian way of praying that's very specific to St. Ignatius of Loyola. There is a Carmelite way of prayer that's crystallized in Teresa of Avila and in John of the Cross. Um, you know, there's a, a you might Salesian way, you might say, a, a way of prayer that St. Francis of Sales, which broadly speaking is much more like Lexio Divina, a bit more focused on meditation, okay. um, the Sulpician method of prayer. So there are these different methods of prayer. Uh, always, though, don't. I had no clue. <laughs> oh yeah, we've got we've got many guides to prayer, many many reliable guides to prayer. There in, in the in, in our time, there are a number of unreliable guides to prayer. Right, and that's why I was like, is there a wrong way? Yes, <laughs> you know? yes, yes. For example, the labyrinth is a wrong way of praying. Uh, uh, if you've never heard of it, don't worry about it. I haven't. It's the wrong way of praying. But now I'm intrigued. <laughs> no, I'm not <laughs> but, going to talk about it. Yes, no, don't. But uh, there are several other these modern, crazy modern things that you know uh, have even been taught, unfortunately, at certain um, uh, retreat centers that I won't name uh, that uh, are, are wrong. They're wrong ways of praying, and even the uh, the they're, they're very new age ways of praying, mm -hmm. and the uh, the uh, Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith even. Uh, has written a document about you know s explaining why these are wrong ways of praying how they really don't they're not christian ways of praying somebody said they totally labyrinth with the rosary whatever that means i don't know <laughs> so he said uh-oh in the beginning so obviously he learned something tonight so aren't you glad you logged i'm so glad he logged in too man um, father we are at our time limit um, but what we always do is offer the opportunity. I want to oh good, you grabbed it. Father also gifted us with this wonderful piece. This is Saint Philomena. Mm -hmm. Right? I said that right? Yes, yeah, an early martyr in the church uh, who was only discovered in the 18th century. And uh, powerful, powerful miracles worked through her, her intercession. She was well beloved of Saint John Marie Vianney, Saint John Vianney, the patient of parish priest. And, uh, She'll be a good guide for prayer. I want a perfect spot right there. Can I mention just a few uh, books? Yep. That's what I was about to ask you. Yes, sir. Okay, we always good. offer the opportunity to talk about resources. So good. Well, of course, the primary resource for our prayer should be, as I said, the sacred scriptures. You know, correct. Uh, the books of the of the Holy Bible. But then I would say also to you, um, uh, a great way to begin is called Introduction to the Devout Life by Saint Francis of Sales. And let me even preface all this with saying, as my dear patron St. Philip says, uh, trustworthy books uh, are ones uh, whose author's name begin with Saint. <laughs> so Saint Bonaventure, Saint. You right. Know, yeah, yeah. So Introduction to the Devout Life by St. Francis de Sales. Uh, the Art of Loving God by St. Francis de Sales as well. Uh, the Life of St. Teresa of Avila. The Way, St. Teresa of Avila. Dark Night of the Soul, uh, St. John of the Cross. Mm -hmm. uh, and then some more modern books would be uh, The Fire Within by uh, Father Thomas Dubé. I really recommend that if you want to get into, it's a very good introduction to a Carmelite uh, way of, uh, of prayer. So Teresa of Avila, John of the Cross, uh, Teresa of the Sea, a Carmelite way of prayer. Uh, the Fire Within by Father Thomas Dubé is a good introduction to that, I would say. Um, Related to that, The Fulfillment of All Desire by Dr. Ralph Martin, uh, Navigating the Interior Life by uh, Mr. Dan Burke. And then there's a, uh, to, if, if someone is um, more, as a, as a kind of a, uh, a very intellectual approach uh, to learning about prayer, uh, there is a, what's called a, 
a manual called The Spiritual Life by uh, uh, Father Adolphe Tanqueray, The Spiritual Life by Father Adolphe Tanqueray, which uh, Bishop Provo also recommends as a good kind of general introduction uh, to um, the interior life overall. It's not going to teach a method of prayer, but it's going to is a very systematic treatment of the interior life, the spiritual life by Father Adolphe Tanqueray. With all the resources we're told every week, and thank you for those, I, my, my book list will be, it's just going to be never, which yeah. is good, because like you said, we always learn. Yeah. Always well, learn. Pick, pick one or two of those yeah. out. Any of those would be good. Um, I love, have the rest I love the there. quote about the, the author being saint. That's that's good. I mean, right? They got it. They, they, they got it, it right. They did it. They, they did it right. <laughs> yes. If they've been canonized, you know. Now, certainly there are more people in heaven that are canonized, but right. we're sure the canonized ones are there. And we're sure not only that, the reason they're canonized is because the life that they lived is uh, teaches others the way to heaven. I will say... Since we started this show, this week has been the most difficult. You talked about distraction, right? Mm. And then prayer, and then in prayer, there's the distraction and putting this together. So um, prayer being what I've known and continue to learn is that it's like center point in your spiritual life and, and, and where it brings you. So whenever you talk about it, expand upon it. Or, or try to deepen it, you, it's rough. I mean, we've never had our children interrupt us this many times, plus our dog went off, so Claire had to step away. During the whole week, everything that led to, you know, just a delay in the process of everything, I mean, it's crazy. We should know this, too, about, of course, our life of prayer, and, our, and, and any time we choose to, we, we decide to be serious about the interior life. We, there's also, a, we have an enemy of the soul. The devil and his agents, his demons, are enemies of our soul. And we are, as St. Paul says in Ephesians, you know, our, our, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the powers of principality. So there are those who don't want us to grow in a relationship with Jesus Christ, who don't want us to be transformed by prayer, who don't want us to waste time on God, you know. And uh, so, yes, of course, we will be opposed. We are opposed. We're in a battle. We can't overlook that if we, if we think we're not in a battle. We're on the wrong side. You know, mm -hmm. so we are in a battle and we need to take up our weapons. One of those is principally, I would say, the most holy rosary. As I said, the rosary, yes, begins with, with vocal prayer, but it's meant to lead us into a, a meditation. Now we know what that means, a consideration of the truths that are in the mysteries and then a contemplation, if God will so grant, and, and a love for him for what he's done and is doing in those mysteries. But yes, we need to take up the rosary as uh, one um, uh, online commentator says, if you're you're not praying the rosary for every day, you're not in the battle and fighting on the wrong side. So we need to take up that Holy Rosary and learn its lessons for sure. Uh, in addition to, I would say, this Collectio Divina, our meditative style of prayer. Yeah, like, anything yeah, you want to say? It's beautiful. Consistency is the thing. Mm. You know, I, I do a lot of these things, but trying to get them all done in one day is a challenge. Some days it happens. But it's not an everyday. It's just I'm not that consistent. Try our best, right? Yeah. That's what we can do. So love, love always wants to uh, get up again and 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 start start a fresh start. You know, with with uh, dedication. But yes, if you consistency is so important. I mean, you you uh, are a chef. You know that if you keep taking the top off of that pot, it's never going to get to the right temperature, and you could yeah. even destroy what you're trying to to do. And so if we don't Did have, you just think that up, or was that in there too? If you keep taking the top off the pot, it's gonna. Yeah. That's such a good analogy. I just I learned that <laughs> quick when you. Seriously, did you just make that up? I think so. Your parable, yeah. Your parable style is good for him. <laughs> it's insane. I'm just like, that's a great point. Keep the t keep the lid on. Keep it on. Yeah. Get it hot. Yeah. Yeah. Fervent inside. Yeah. Thank you, Father. Seriously. It's been a great pleasure. Thank you very much. Good, good seeing you all again. Uh, I keep seeing all the comments. Everybody is very thankful for the information that you shared as well. There's some follow-up questions that maybe I might send to you, and we can put the answers out there for people to see. Again, the questions for the show come from me and the viewers. So we thank you all for joining tonight. I know we went over by about 15 minutes, but we thank you for giving your extra time. 
Um, and I, I hope you like this format because we certainly oh, enjoy yeah. him being here in person. It's just, and then yes. what he yes. brought with him is yes. insane. If anything, if we did anything tonight, we remove some rest together. 